Um, last year, I was at the Climate Informatics Workshop, and I gave a version of this talk on deep learning for climate science. Um, so for those of you in the audience, you know there might be 30% uh, overlap between this talk and, and last year's version. But I think what I'm going to do today is to, to chat broadly about deep learning for science. Um, so again, as a peer supercomputing center, so I work at NERSC, uh, which is Berkeley Lab Supercomputing Center. There are probably a lot of things that we now know about applying deep learning systematically to a range of scientific problems that may be applicable to what you do in NCAR. All right, so I think what I'm going to do is to start off with just briefly introducing you to NERSC. Uh, some of you may know about NERSC already, but essentially I think what I'll do is comment a little bit about how change, the, na the nature of science is changing uh, at, at NERSC. Uh, chat a little bit about the hardware and software that we are, we are deploying for the data analytics uh, users. Uh, have some you know, obligatory remarks to make in deep learning for the industry, but most of the talk is going to focus on uh, concrete use cases from deep learning for science. So we'll review a lot of those success stories. Uh, then we'll chat about open challenges. Again, the reason we all are, are in the research world is because there are open problems to work on. So I think I, I want to at least expose you to, to what we know are uh, the open challenges in deep learning for science. And then we'll try and conclude. So first, uh, NERSC. Uh, NERSC is the, the mission HPC facility for the DOE Office of Science Research. So again, uh, we, we cover a broad range of scientific areas. Uh, there's uh, biology and, and genomics. Uh, in the environment side, we have um, uh, climate science. Uh, a lot of projects on the particle physics, astrophysics side of things, uh, nuclear physics, uh, fusion, plasma, uh, material science, chemistry, geophysics. On the computing side, uh, DOE has, uh, you know, is the agency that was responsible for the Terascale, the Petascale, and now the Exascale computing projects. Uh, but apart from just setting up big machines and getting them to run, uh, we have a very strong applied math program. So a lot of people who work on PD solvers and get PD solvers to work for uh, a range of application areas. Maybe one of the more unique things about NERSC is really the breadth of users that we have. So at this point in time, we have anywhere northwards of 7,000 users, and 800 different projects are using our supercomputers at this point in time. So this is uh, a schematic of our, our machine room. So there are two big supercomputers at any point in time. Uh, the flagship machine right now is a Cray XC40 system. We have a tradition of naming our supercomputers after scientists, so it's called Cori. Uh, so it's, it's number 10 on the top 500 list. There are about 9,800 Knights Landing nodes and about 2,000 Haswell nodes, uh, a lot of memory in, in aggregate. But I think typically what we find is that when people want to run data analysis at scale, uh, I.O. is the big, big challenge. That's the first problem that they encounter. So we have a range of different file systems. Um, there's a Luster 28-petabyte uh, sized file system uh, that can support hundreds of gigabytes a second I.O. rates. Uh, but then uh, for, for I.O., we, we do need more. So there is a big pool of uh, SSD memory called the burst buffer, uh, one and a half petabytes in particular. And then that pool can sustain one and a half pe uh, terabytes a second uh, I.O. rates. A range of different legacy file systems, so um, you know GPFS, HPSS tapes, so on and so forth. I think maybe the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, NERSC is connected to other peer supercomputing centers through this uh, energy sciences network, uh, which has both 100 gig and 400 gigabit link uh, connections. So if you have a big data set in some other facility, a telescope, or a sequencer, or what have you, then using ESNet, you can move data in and out of NERSC uh, quite, quite efficiently. Now, uh, NERSC has supported simulation workloads for about 40 years. Um, and in the last five or 10 years, I would say that we've been supporting a number of uh, use cases from what we call is the experimental and observational uh, data science community. So in, in particular, what I mean by that are, are astronomers. So you have a range of different telescopes in the US, but, but also worldwide. And nightly, these telescopes send us data, uh, which we then crank through a workflow to find uh, transients and, and other interesting objects. The LHC, of course, is a, you know, it's probably one of the grandest instruments in science. Uh, and the LHC can essentially produce a petabyte of data in a second. Uh, so uh, you know, once they've done the, the down filtering and, uh, and so on, uh, they, they get the data rates down to a gigabyte a second. And even then, in aggregate, there's about maybe 10 petabytes of data worldwide uh, that the LSC project has produced. So NERSC uh, definitely stores a bunch of that data. And there are, again, production workflows that analyze uh, this data set. We have certainly a range of different light sources, um, beam lines that can emit X-ray particles, and then you can put a crystal or a biological specimen in front of it, collect a bunch of images, and then maybe run some reconstruction algorithm. So the advanced light source um, and, and the linear coherent light source are two experiments that we support. Uh, 
Genomics, I would say genome sequencing is, is definitely productionized at this point. So we have the Joint Genome Institute where farms of sequences run, uh, and then they're able to ship their data to us um, weekly, uh, and we run production workflows on, on these as well. So really what's happening, what's changing, I think in the last three or so years, is that uh, um, net, we now receive more data then we, we export. So it is no longer the case that the big simulation running, the big uh, super, you know, PD solver on, on a supercomputer produces more data. It is, in fact, the case that all of these experiments uh, in aggregate uh, produce more data, which is now net coming in, into NERSC. And associated with these data sources, uh, the workflows have become much more complex. So again, in the simulation community, it used to be the case that you, know, you, you prepare your input deck for your simulation code. Uh, configure it, submit your job in a queue, you know, come back three days later, and hopefully things are, you know, have run successfully. That is not the modality in which these data science users want to operate in. So they want to be able to stream their data to a supercomputing center. Uh, they want real-time interactive access. And most importantly, the data stack, the software that they want to run, is a very rich ecosystem of technologies. So these users are not using C and Fortran. They're not going to go there. Uh, but they, instead, they're relying on Jupyter Notebooks and, uh, and, and Python and so on and so forth. Uh, increasingly, also, important scientific problems involve running both simulation and data analysis, uh, sometimes coupled together. And I think what's been called out repeatedly is that they need more advanced machine learning and statistics uh, from here on out. Now, this is a message, obviously, that we get, you know, not just from our 7,000-strong user community, but then when DOE overall uh, reaches out to all of the different offices that we have, and we talk to scientists about their uh, scientific requirements for the next three years, five years, 10 years, uh, there are a number of themes that we see. And again, uh, one of the important themes is the requirement for uh, machine learning and advanced statistics. So that's something which is uh, coming up, I would say, in, in a, in a bottom-up fashion. So when we actually go and talk to users on, hey, you know, you say you want to do advanced statistics or machine learning, what, what is it that you mean? Um, so this is sort of one attempt at summarizing the broad landscape of what uh, users mean when they say uh, they want to do machine learning or start. So along rows, uh, you know, what is essentially shown are different tasks that you might want to solve. So maybe you have a pattern classification task or a regression task. Uh, so those are typically done in a supervised context. Uh, but then you might have some unsupervised tasks, uh, clustering, dimensionality reduction. Uh, sometimes, you know, despite all of the supercomputing power we have, uh, people do care about surrogate models. Uh, so that's a task that comes up. Uh, sometimes folks care about design of experiments. So how do you optimally turn the knobs of a simulation or an ex experiment uh, to get good data? Uh, people do care about feature learning and then anomaly detection. So those are some of the canonical tasks that people want to solve. And then along rows are different domain science areas. So in, in, um, in the DOE, we have the Office for High Energy Physics, uh, Biological and Environmental Research, Basic Energy Sciences, Nuclear Physics, and Fusion. And then associated with those offices, you have you know, a range of different domains, so astronomy, cosmology, particle physics, climate, genomics, so on and so forth. And every X here is essentially you know, scientists, so say a uh, particle physicist might want to solve a pattern classification problem. Sorry, so this is sort of the broad landscape of problems that people want to solve. And obviously, we, we're not going to have time today to go through all of these excess. Uh, but, but this can be one way to summarize uh, what really needs to happen in the data analytics uh, space from here on out. So in order to accommodate some of these use cases, uh, one of the primary things that me and my group have done in the last three years is to articulate what a data stack needs to be. Uh, to address the, the use cases that we are seeing in data intensive science. So while the talk is going to be about deep learning and, and machine learning, which is a subset of data analytics, uh, I think the, the purpose of the putting up the stack here is just to convey to you that you know, it's not a matter of just um, training a deep learning model and you're done with, with solving your data problem. Chances are that you need to move your data. Uh, chances are that once your data is in place, uh, you need to be able to point or share that data set with your community. Increasingly, you might also want to share your uh, code with the rest of your community. So there are a bunch of tools, and I'll just call out that Jupyter Notebooks is an increasingly popular tool to enable you to do that. Workflows are important. So again, automating uh, the movement of data, automating uh, the process of analysis. If things fail, retrying. Um, all of those things are capabilities that workflow systems can provide for you. Uh, 
data management is important. So again, if you're going to be storing a petabyte of data in text CSV files, things are just not going to scale. Um, so I think all of you are probably are aware of the NetCDF file format. That's a standard I.O. middleware that we have. But then there are other, other solutions as well, including HDF5 and NetCDF that, that people use. Sometimes uh, storing structured data in these I.O. middleware is not, not convenient. So there are uh, database technologies like MongoDB and so on and so forth, wherein you can st store unstructured data more easily. Visualization, we do have uh, Visit and Paraview as the preferred scientific visualization tools. Now, on the analytics side, um, you know, I'll, I'll note that, again, C and Fortran are not the preferred languages of choice. Uh, instead, uh, people prefer Python for general purpose analytics. If you're a statistician, chances are that you've used R uh, in your, in your uh, program. Uh, and Julia is certainly an up-and-coming language that we support uh, at NERSC. There are also broader analytics frameworks like Spark, which we do uh, support. Uh, MATLAB and Mathematica are there. They're always going to be there, I guess, as legacy tools. Um, and then finally, of course, there are a bunch of deep learning uh, frameworks that we support. So I'm going to talk about the deep learning stuff next. So again, uh, if, if deep learning is what you want to do, um, then we point our users to Keras as a higher level framework for uh, you know, just essentially in a few lines of code expressing what a network should be. But then if you're happy to do a little bit of low level hacking, then uh, TensorFlow from Google, uh, Cafe from Berkeley, and PyTorch from Facebook are the, are the technologies we, pro we point users to. Now, there's a long tail in this space. Uh, you know, every other week, every other month, there is a new deep learning framework. Uh, we can't possibly optimize and scale every single framework there is. But for the time being, these, these four technologies are the ones that we point users to. Now, everything from there on below is something that you, know, you as a user don't worry about. Uh, you know, it's folks who, worry at, who work at supercomputing centers, you know, they, in collaboration with industry vendors, uh, worry about it. So right now, um, you know, we have CPUs in KNL. Uh, there's certainly a range of many different accelerators you can use for deep learning. But going from a high-level framework to low-level hardware, you do need to worry about single node libraries, how do you do linear algebra in an optimal fashion, and then how do different nodes communicate with each other. So there are, there's a host of different libraries that you can, you can choose to leverage. All right, so that's sort of what we are doing in the hardware and in the software space in terms of making tools available to our users. Um, I'll just broadly call out that um, uh, you know, it's important to keep in mind the broad analytics landscape as well. Um, so methods like graph analytics or doing image, conventional image and signal processing, doing conventional linear algebra, those are always going to be there. Uh, a lot of people rely on that, and th that requirement is not going away. Obviously, you know, a lot of you, a lot of people have sophisticated statistical models or statistical tests that they want to continue to run on, the, on their data sets, and we support that as well. But now, I think, you know, in the last, I would say, six years, the, the field of AI has, has uh, you know, made dramatic uh, improvements. And it's impossible to ignore that at a supercomputing center. So within the, the field of broad general purpose AI, there's, there's machine learning. And within that, you have deep learning. So we certainly have you know, use cases in, in all of these. I'll, I'll also quickly note that um, it is not the case that deep learning is going to subsume all of, all of the flavors of analytics there are. Uh, so while deep learning is very good at solving a subset of problems, and we'll get to what subset of problems deep learning seems to be working with best for towards the end of the talk. But as a, you know, as a facility that supports data analytics for our scientific community, uh, deep learning is not replacing everything. So we do have to make sure that our software stack and our, our hardware uh, keeps this, this broad solution landscape uh, in, in mind. All right, so I think that was it about you know, how science is changing at NERSC. Uh, essentially, EOD users, um, experimental observational data users, require more advanced analytics, a richer stack. And we are trying to make sure that our existing HPC systems support a contemporary data stack and certainly supports the range of analytics uh, flavors that, that you might have. Now, just in case uh, you, know, you haven't been tracking the, the media recently, um, big things are happening. So essentially, Microsoft and Google have both reinvented themselves as AI-first companies. Um, uh, you know, Facebook and uh, Intel have spent a lot of money in opening new research labs and buying startups. Um, uh, you know, in aggregate, more money is being spent on AI right now than you know any other program in in the DOE, for example. So really, something is is going on here, and uh, you might you might question why uh, why now. Uh, there have been a, a number of breakthroughs that have now been reported again in the last uh, six years. Uh, in the field of computer vision, you have the task of um, given a complex image, uh, you know, up to uh, up here, four complex images. Uh, find me uh, cats and dogs or, or other uh, objects in the scene. Uh, 
Uh, and now computer vision systems powered by deep learning uh, can solve this problem better than, than human experts. Uh, if you've used your iPhone or Android device recently, you may have observed that uh, the quality of speech recognition has certainly improved. Uh, and again, deep learning systems are, are behind that. Um, AlphaGo is, is uh, well, rather, the, the, Go, the game of Go was supposed to be an exponentially harder game uh, compared to the complexity of chess. Uh, and now two of the world's leading grandmasters in, in the game of Go have been defeated convincingly by, by a deep learning system. And uh, self-driving cars are no longer uh, fiction uh, in, in California and a few other uh, states. Uh, certainly, these cars have been put out, and you know they, are, uh, they, they seem to be working. So really, uh, across these four use cases and many others, uh, deep learning seems to be having a lot of impact. So five years ago, we asked, as, as we asked ourselves this question, well, you know, deep learning seems to be working for computer vision, speech recognition, robotic systems, control systems. Can it work for science? Uh, there are certainly similarities in the kinds of problems we need to solve in science. But there are some differences. Um, in particular, scientific data is different from commodity RGB images that you might capture from your camera. We typically have many more channels corresponding to many more variables. Uh, the precision associated with our data sets is, is higher. Uh, the kinds of noise and artifacts that we have are, are different. Uh, but most importantly, the statistics corresponding to clusters or, or uh, uh, classifiers is, is likely different in scientific data uh, compared to commercial data sets. So as a piece of statistical machinery, can deep learning learn to separate out clusters or separate out uh, patterns from each other is an open question. And uh, essentially, I think by the end of the talk, what I'll, I'll the, the message is that uh, deep learning, sure enough, can, can work in the scientific context as well, despite the data sets being different in science uh, compared to what you might have in the industry. All right, so we're going to spend uh, most of our time on, on uh, again, deep learning use cases in science. So again, people have speculated about maybe you know, deep learning can be applied and so on and so forth. But today, I want to share actual results of, of deep learning working in practice. So the first example um, you know, is hopefully close to your hearts in that um, uh, climate scientists have spent 40 years in developing extremely sophisticated models. And you can easily configure different carbon emission scenarios, run them out through the end of the century. And you know, sure enough, you have a, a you know, 100 terabyte data set that you, that you now need to analyze. Reducing that data set dramatically by computing a global annual mean temperature or a sea level rise you know, doesn't really do justice to all of that complexity. So uh, increasingly, uh, some of our uh, climate science collaborators are interested in characterizing not just global annual mean quantities, but then, al but then also uh, extreme weather uh, characteristics. So in particular, um, what we care about are looking at the evolution of hurricanes, uh, extratropical cyclones, uh, atmospheric rivers, and, and even things like weather fronts. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, um, are such events, so are hurricanes, uh, going to become more extreme in the future? Uh, when they make landfall, will they be associated with more precipitation? Uh, will there be more Cat 4 or Cat 5 storms? Uh, for atmospheric rivers, which are responsible for most of, say, California's precipitation, uh, will, the, will the storm tracks shift northwards? And hence, uh, atmospheric rivers won't make landfall at all in, in California. If that happens, uh, then the, the people who care about water, water resource management uh, will need to find an alternative source of, uh, of fresh water. So um, essentially, f automatically finding these patterns uh, in large, say, 100 terabyte size data sets boils down to a pattern recognition problem. This is basically the problem of activity detection in video. Now this um, you know, is a movie, just for those of you who may, may not have looked at climate simulations before, this is just a quick visual depiction of uh, a quarter degree model, so something called the CAMP5 community atmospheric model uh, running in a quarter degree resolution. And again, through a lot of hard work, um, uh, these models are now capable of um, uh, producing storm systems. So you can see a number of tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers and extropical cyclones uh, in this movie. But now imagine that you're sitting in front of this movie that's playing out for 100 years. Uh, how are you going to objectively find and track these patterns in space and time? So that is, is basically the problem that we want to solve. So there is a close analogy between what needs to happen uh, in the climate science context when you compare it to computer vision. So in computer vision, um, uh, people you know, may look at images of cats and dogs on, on, in YouTube. Um, and uh, given this RGB image, uh, you want to solve the binary classification task of, um, you know, is there a cat in this image or not, yes or no? So just two labels that you need to predict. Uh, 
The localization task is finding a tight bonding box corresponding to the object of interest. The detection task is given uh, a, a big image with multiple objects potentially overlapping. Uh, draw me different size bonding boxes uh, around different cats and dogs and ducks. The, the segmentation task is, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with just coarse bonding boxes. I'd like a pixel level segmentation mask uh, of, of these patterns. So exactly the same task for climate science, uh, given a multivariate spatial temporal patch. Um, I'd like you to tell me, the computer vision system, to tell me whether there is a hurricane, say, in this image or not. I'd like you to give me a, a, a bonding box around the hurricane. Given a global snapshot of the climate system, uh, you know, draw me variable size bonding boxes around uh, tropical cyclones in yellow and, say, you know, an extropical cyclone in green and an atmospheric river in red. Uh, and then the segmentation task is give me pixel level segmentation masks. So essentially, in the next um, you know, four or five slides, what we're going to show is that all of these tasks can be solved with deep learning. So over the past three years, we've developed a range of different architectures uh, which can basically solve all of these problems. So starting with the first task of uh, binary classification, um, uh, essentially the task here is that you know, I, I give you a bunch of training data. So uh, somehow I'm going to find ground truth data. It can be human labeled uh, data sets or perhaps some heuristic that the community trusts. Um, so that's going to be our, our ground truth. Uh, we're going to split it up into a training and a test uh, data set. Um, we're going to apply a range of different uh, machine learning methods. So methods like logistic regression, k nearest neighbors, support vector machines, random forests. And then you know, we're going to design deep learning architecture. So again, it's sort of out of scope for me in this talk to give you a tutorial on deep learning architectures. Um, but maybe it suffices to say that essentially what happens in deep learning is that you have a an input data set that gets successively um, uh, convolved, and there are some nonlinearities that you apply. Uh, and in the end, uh, the network makes a prediction. So using an architecture pretty much like this, um, you can design individual networks to pull out tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers and weather fronts with fairly high levels of accuracy. So what's being plotted here are uh, accuracies on a held out test data set. So I think the, you know, the two big takeaways from, from this uh, was, A, um, all of the predictive accuracies are actually quite high. So everything is more than 80%, which to me, I think, leads me to believe that maybe the climate science community hasn't looked very hard at, at machine learning methods. And two, um, uh, sure enough, deep learning can give you state-of-the-art results across the board. So uh, deep learning can operate on realistic um, scientific data sets. So this was the first sort of proof of concept that uh, deep learning can handle uh, climate data sets. So we moved on from the supervised task of binary classification to something called a semi-supervised formulation of the problem. Um, so again, you know, if you, if you care about 10 different uh, patterns, uh, you're not going to be designing 10 different architectures uh, to look at the data set. What you really want is a unified architecture that can discover all patterns, both the 10 patterns that, uh, that you might have ground truth label data for, but then also potentially new patterns that you may not have labels for. So, uh, and, and by the way, I should note that uh, the people who've done all, all the real work are all called on on the, on the bottom of the slide. So you're you know, welcome to check them out and, and some of the papers that are accompanying the, the results here. So what we did for this uh, semi-supervised architecture was the following. Uh, <clears throat> so we designed an encoder. So essentially, um, you start off with the raw image. You do a bunch of convolutions and pooling. Uh, you come up with a compact representation of the features. Uh, and then off this compact representation of features, you ask the network to predict uh, variable size bounding boxes and class labels. So you do have ground truth data for, say, three patterns. So that's a, a fairly conventional uh, deep network. But then there is a twist in this particular architecture in that there is also a decoder piece. Um, so working off the same compact representation of features, you ask the network to decode and create an image which has the same dimensionality as the input. So simultaneously, what this network is going to do is try to solve for two objectives. One, try to maximize the predictive accuracy for classes that it's aware of, that it has ground truth for. And then two, minimize the reconstruction error loss, so an L2 uh, loss, between the input and the output. I think in the morning today, we had a bunch of discussions around uh, using deep learning for uh, compression. So essentially, what the network is doing here is compression. It takes uh, a raw data set at a certain uh, dimensionality it compresses it into a certain uh, uh, representation. And then off that representation, it's going to try to predict bounding boxes and, and the raw field. So these are some of the results from the output of the reconstruction. So on the left are different fields 
um, which are input, and then this is what the network produces as the output after having gone through the encoding and decoding phase. So in general, it can capture uh, you know, patterns of spatial variability. But really, I think the thing that we were after was a joint network, a single network that can predict multiple weather patterns. So in this image, uh, again, it's a global snapshot of the climate system. The, the ground truth is in green. So you have a bunch of green boxes corresponding to tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers and extropical cyclones. And then the network is making predictions with red bounding boxes. Um, so generally, uh, a single network is able to predict tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers and ETC. So that's good. Uh, it's, it's missing out on a few events, and it is definitely get, getting the scale wrong. So that's something which, again, we, we uh, continue to work on. Um, but as a proof of concept, um, it is certainly possible to train a single network that can pull out uh, multiple weather patterns. Now, the, the fact of the matter, really, I think, for practitioners is that such networks take a long time to, to converge. Um, so scaling deep learning out on big machines is really quite important. Uh, again, in climate data sets, in, in climate science, we have massive data sets easily accessible to us. Um, so last year in SC17, we did have a paper that um, uh, essentially took deep learning and it scaled it out to uh, 9,600 nodes. That's the Cori Knight's landing partition that we have. Uh, and through a range of different uh, synchronization schemes, uh, we were able to scale this out on, on the entire machine. You know, we got about um, two teraflops on a single KNL node. The, the theoretical peak for a KNL is six teraflops, so that's a fairly high fraction of peak. Uh, and then overall, the network can uh, can sustain about 15 teraflops of, of performance. So we took it to the next level, uh, which is you know we we saw well, we made headway towards the binary classification problem. Detection is starting to look good now. The segmentation problem. So again, um, uh, the the goal here is given a global snapshot, I want a pixel by pixel segmentation mask for different phenomena. So again, here uh, the atmospheric rivers are are colored in blue, and then the tropical cyclones are are colored in red as the output of the network. Just to zoom in on some of these, so. The ground truth for the network, um, what the network sees, uh, is is in is in black contour lines. So uh, over here, the ground truth for atmospheric rivers is is in black contours, and then the the ground truth for tropical cyclones is in is in black contour lines. And after you've trained the network, I'll show you the architecture for the network in a second. But after you train the network, uh, the network predicts on a pixel by pixel level where it thinks the atmospheric river is. And generally, we see uh, you know fairly good agreement between. Uh, the, the network and, uh, and and the ground truth. So uh, in order to pull off these two results, the, the segmentation results, uh, we had to come up with a fairly extensive network. So uh, broadly, what goes as the input is a raw CAM5 field. So uh, a million uh, grid points and about 16 channels. And then what comes as the output are uh, you know, a, a field with the same spatial resolution as the, the CAM5 image. But then uh, there are three channels only, one corresponding to the background class, one corresponding to atmospheric rivers, and one corresponding to tropical cyclones. So uh, similar to the semi-supervised architecture, there is an encoder piece, uh, a lot of processing that happens here. Again, a compact representation is learned for, for the features, and then there is a decoder piece that produces the segmentation. Uh, there are a bunch of details around having some residual connections and some skip connections, which really makes the, the network converge here. But uh, essentially, this is an extremely, extremely demanding uh, uh, piece of uh, computation. So we were successful in scaling, so optimizing and scaling this particular network out to uh, world's number one supercomputer at this point in time. So that's the Summit system at, at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, so Summit comprises of, of about 4,560 plus uh, nodes. Each node has a state-of-the-art Volta GPU. So that's about 27,000 Volta GPUs. And uh, we were able to, um, you know, off the um, 120 teraflops that you can obtain on a, on a Volta GPU in 16-bit precision, uh, we were able to get to about 40 teraflops. Uh, so we scaled this network out to the entire machine. Um, uh, the network does converge. Um, and we were able to achieve, uh, uh, you know, 1.13 exops in, in peak and about 0.99 exops sustained. So, you know, we've talked about exascale computing for about a decade now. Um, and uh, uh, this year's Gordon Bell finalists are actually really all, all interesting in their own right. But uh, this is the first example of an exascale uh, deep learning application at scale. Um, so uh, you know, if you're at the SC18 conference, you know, please do drop by, uh, by, uh, by the talk. So you'll get a 45-minute a version of, of these two slides, uh, I, I guess. 
All right, so, uh, so that was climate science. Uh, so I think the, the key takeaway there is that deep learning can work on high resolution climate model output and the quality of results seems to be pretty good. So I'm gonna shift tracks to a different domain science, uh, cosmology. Um, uh, so again, uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth in these applications, but really the idea is to give you a, a general sense for the kinds of problems that, that deep learning seems to be working on. So uh, in this case, uh, you know, we have a certain theoretical model of cosmology. Um, uh, so people characterize modern cosmology by 10 numbers. They may correspond to different parameterizations of dark energy, dark matter, so on and so forth. You plug in those 10 numbers, very much like you plug in uh, numbers into a climate model. You run the, um, uh, the model out for a slightly longer period of time. It's about 13.7 billion years. Uh, and then you stop. Um, uh, and then essentially, there might be a box with these idealized dark matter particles. And your job is to compare this box with, say, a trillion particles to the universe that you observe through your telescopes. Um, so if they agree, then maybe your choices of these 10 numbers are, are, are good. Um, but if not, you need to go back and, and tweak the 10 numbers. So uh, I think one of the challenges really early on in this project, and of course, this is an open project, uh, but uh, the, the, the challenge early on was to compute summary statistics. Again, you know, the field of statistics has many, many metrics for, for computing summary numbers. Um, so, uh, so we now have capabilities to do clustering, say, on a trillion particles. We now have capabilities to compute three-point correlation on, a trillion, on, on billions of galaxies. Everything can be done in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, uh, so there is a way for you to essentially take simulations and compare them to observations. But essentially, we, we thought that, you know, why not just take a step back and frame this as a regression problem? Uh, I can produce many, many simulated universes. For every simulated universe, I know what the cosmological constants are. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the setup for my machine learning system. Uh, your input data is a simulated universe. The output, uh, the, the task that the regression problem needs to solve is a cosmological constant. And let's see if deep learning uh, can, can, is, is up to the task. And I'll, I'll note that this, this idea was originally proposed by uh, some colleagues at CMU. Uh, and essentially, when they tried to scale the problem up to multiple cosmological constants and larger data sets, uh, a few GPUs in a university cluster somewhere just were, were not up to the task. So essentially, what we did this year was um, enhance that particular architecture, so design a 3D convolutional network. So right now, all of the examples I gave in the climate context were all operating on 2D images. But uh, the universe is 3D. Um, uh, and at least the, the representation of the universe in an idealized box is 3D. So we developed a 3D convolutional architecture um, and essentially trained the network uh, at scale. Uh, and these are some of the science results. Essentially for three of the cosmological parameters, uh, the ground truth is in the diagonal line. Uh, and then the output of the deep learning system on a held out data set are uh, two configurations of, of, of that run are, are uh, indicated by the red dot. So in, in general, there seems to be reasonable agreement. Um, and for some of the parameters, the, the estimates that we are getting with deep learning are, are more accurate than has been obtained historically. But maybe on the computer science side, I think one of the more interesting aspects of this run was that this was all TensorFlow code. So again, you may know that Google has been pushing the TensorFlow technology for a while now. And uh, we took uh, unmodified, pretty much unmodified TensorFlow code and we got this to scale on, again, all of Cori. And uh, the performance that we were able to obtain was uh, three and a half petaflops. So it's uh, you know, highly performant, performant code. Now, taking this a step further, um, uh, you know, can you synthetically create virtual universes without resorting to an n-body physics simulation? Uh, so there's a whole line of architectures called uh, generative adversarial networks in, deep in the deep learning community. So far, GANs have been applied to uh, problems of modeling celebrity faces and you know uh, images uh, of, of of the real world, um, but uh, maybe a more scientifically used case is is the problem of surrogate modeling. Uh, so essentially, um, uh, in a game theoretic formulation, uh, a GAN architecture uh, proposes synthetic data, and so that's a deep learning network. That's a generator. And then you have a different deep learning network that's a discriminator, uh, which whose job it is to discriminate between real data and the deep learning generated synthetic data. The goal of this whole procedure is to fool the discriminator completely. So if the discriminator is making mistakes all the time, uh, that means that you've, you've now uh, 
the, the generator, the deep learning network that's generating data has maybe learned uh, the underlying distribution of your original, uh, uh, the, the, the original process. So we tried this out for the first time for cosmology data. So again, these are synthetic mass maps that are produced from cosmology simulations. And uh, as a diagnostic, you know, we are not, we're not relying on perceptual appearance. So you know, does this face, face look realistic? But we can actually compute a range of summary statistics. So this is a pass spectra for, um, uh, you know, for the generated output. And essentially what we see is that the power spectrum matches up um, across the entire spectrum that, that we, across the entire range that we care about. So this was quite an intriguing result because it appears that uh, the, the GAN architecture uh, is learning statistical properties of the underlying distribution without being told to, to model that. So that is uh, intriguing. I'm gonna come back to GANs for a different use case from high energy physics uh, in, in a moment. So moving on to astronomy, um, you know, one of the grand challenge projects that we have is, is on um, uh, getting our hands on all of the telescope data that we can find, uh, and then creating a, a unified catalog of all of the visible objects. Um, so, um, uh, so this is called the Celeste project, and um, the first versions of this project uh, you know, what did what, what I guess I would call the right thing, or at least the statisticians in the audience will sign off on, on that, hopefully. Um, so we, we created a, a graphical model, a generative model for, um, uh, for how astronomical images form. So we come up with uh, a graphical model that parameterizes different properties of uh, stars and galaxies. Uh, in collaboration with physicists, we work out what the conditional relationships are uh, between the parameters. And then we model how an ideal representation of a star somewhere in the sky will result in a certain photon count on a CCD sensor. Now, all you observe, of course, at the end of the day, are CCD counts. And your job is, given this observable, infer point estimates for all of the, 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 the parameters of your model, but then also uncertainty estimates corresponding to the parameters. So it took, it took us about two years to actually create this graphical model that the physicist would sign off on. Uh, and then the challenge is, you know, how do you do inference at scale on this particular model? There are only two really techniques that can likely scale. So, you know, one is uh, variational inference, uh, the other is MCMC. So for this project, we went with variational inference. We implemented that in Julia, uh, and then we scaled it out. Um, so that Julia code is essentially now can process you know, 50 plus terabytes of SCSS data in 15 minutes. Uh, and I think maybe for those of you who are Julia fans in the audience, um, uh, this is the first uh, example of a Julia application scaling out to a petaflop on, uh, on the Cori system. But maybe, you know, for statisticians, uh, you know, this graphical model inference procedure was able to uh, infer point and uncertainty estimates for uh, 8 billion parameters for many different stars and galaxies. So this was, this was great, uh, uh, but essentially I think what we found is that galaxies turn out to be very hard to model parametrically. Uh, the, the, the visual appearance, uh, the range of visual appearance for galaxies uh, is hard to lock down with, with two numbers. Um, so these are just some, some visuals of um, you know, how, how radically different galaxies might be. So for the, the piece, the box corresponding to modeling galaxies, uh, we now have an, a variational order encoder. So again, Jeff Regier and, and other colleagues in Berkeley uh, have essentially swapped out a piece of the graphical model that is in charge of, uh, of, of uh, characterizing the, the appearance of galaxies. And this is the, uh, the architecture that we use. And sure enough, it can beat a uh, mixture of Gaussians uh, easily, uh, and it can learn to segregate uh, different kinds of galaxies, so spiral galaxies from ellipt elliptical galaxies and so on and so forth. So that seems to work uh, fairly, fairly well. All right, so uh, moving from uh, astronomy to neuroscience. Uh, so again, the Obama Brain Initiative a few years ago, um, uh, you know, kick-started a number of projects around developing new sensor technology that could capture high fidelity, high spatial fidelity uh, temporal data from, from the brain. So in this case, the goal of the project is to create something called the, uh, the Stephen Hawking device, which is, uh, you know, you, ha you may have a person who's, uh, mentally active, but, uh, but they, they can't quite control their vocal tracks. They can't articulate speech. So there are these you know, amazing neuroscientists, neurosurgeons in UCSF who, um, OK, I'm going to sp speed up, um, who, uh, who actually conduct surgery. They implant a chip uh, in the part of the brain that's responsible for speech planning. Uh, and essentially, you can read off spike train data. Uh, and you have patients uh, reading after surgery. Uh, 
uh, reading Alice in Wonderland. Uh, so you have ground truth data in terms of the speech, the syllables that they are articulating. Uh, and you have input data in terms of the spike train. Um, and the goal of the deep learning system is to learn a mapping between the input to the output. And again, uh, you know, across the board, compared to linear networks, uh, deep learning networks, across the board, across different subjects, can do a, a better job. Um, I, one of the more interesting <coughs> things about this particular project was that uh, looking at the structure of the errors that are being made by the deep net system. So if you look at the confusion matrix of the ground truth versus what the network is predicting, and you do a simple hierarchical single, link, single linkage clustering, then essentially um, consonants that uh, you know are produced by moving, say, the tongue to the top of your mouth, um, essentially places that are co-located in the mouth where you might have a harder time distinguishing uh, speech is exactly the kinds of mistakes that the deep learning system makes. So that was really quite an interesting uh, outcome of, of this project. All right, so I'm going to uh, maybe conclude the science case studies with high-energy physics. So again, the LHC community is extremely sophisticated. And um, you know, we talked about the petabyte a second number. Um, there, is, there is no system in the world that can read off that amount of data. So essentially, what particle physicists do is to, is to encode uh, pattern detection logic in FPGAs around the LHC. Uh, and that, that logic is the thing that gets you down by six orders of magnitude from a petabyte a second to <clears throat> a gigabyte a second. So for about 20 years, uh, you know, this is a, a rock curve. Um, high-energy physicists have used a certain cut to uh, distinguish signal or more interesting physics from background. Uh, and now uh, deep learning systems uh, can easily beat that. So uh, this is the performance of the deep learning system uh, that can be obtained. I'll, I'll quickly note that the false positive rates you know, are, are really quite something uh, in, in high-energy physics. So we are, they, they, they have very, very stringent requirements. Um, uh, so this is not the entire rock curve. Uh, this is uh, you know, one end of the spectrum that, that they care about. I'm going to skip the, the Calogan discussion. Basically, um, uh, LHC physicists spend 30% time of, uh, of the simulation uh, codes um, characterizing the behavior of, uh, of their detector before they create it. Uh, and now, uh, I think what we are finding is that a suitably trained GAN for high-energy physics can reproduce the right uh, energy profile. So that's also quite, quite intriguing. I'm going to skip the neutrino classification problem. Let's, let's come back to the matrix. So, uh, so again, you know, we started with this matrix as a tabulation of various use cases. Um, you know, we had time to cover maybe seven or so uh, success stories right now. I could have talked about seven more. Um, but really, I think it's important to take a step back and understand what the common theme is across all of these use cases. So essentially, I think what we are finding is that um, in the supervised context, when you have label data, um, variants of convolutional architectures, 2D, 3D, 4D, or LSTMs that can take sequences into account seem to work fairly well across the board for pattern classification and regression problems. So I'm, I'm really quite confident that deep learning you know, is, is a viable technology to explore in this space. For unsupervised formulations of the problem, so problems involving clustering or dimensional reductions, you can certainly explore autoencoders. You can use them for uh, compression even. But it's, the, the conclusions are, aren't as definite. So I think there's more work needed to get this to work. Now GANs, I think the two results that we have so far in high-energy physics and cosmology are extremely intriguing. Uh, so it's possible that you know, one could train GANs for surrogate models. I think the problem of uh, subgrid scale parameterizations come up in climate science all the time. There's a, there's a possibility that GANs could work in that context. Uh, design of experiments, you know, there are people who've applied reinforcement learning quite successfully. There's a possible that you could retarget reinforcement learning for looking at design of experiment problems. Feature learning, I would certainly say that um, you know, across the board, uh, you know, we as humans, as scientists, might have overestimated our capabilities to design features uh, for, for pattern classification and regression problems. So this, I think, across the board, deep learning seems to be doing a great job at. Anomaly detection, I'm, I'm really not sure if deep learning is the right method. So that's, uh, you know, something to think about. All right. So open challenges. Um, so we've been doing this for about five years. You know, there are a number of other projects that are also ongoing. Uh, I think this is a summary of... Uh, uh, you know, challenges that we, I think, as a community, will need to address in the short term. Um, deep learning frameworks out of the box, you know, you download TensorFlow or PyTorch or what have you, uh, they will typically not handle complex scientific data. So handling 3D data, 4D data, multi-channel data, 
uh, handling dense data or sparse data natively, uh, handling graphs uh, is something that deep nets that that these frameworks don't do. Uh, Hyperparameter optimization is a big problem. So again, as domain scientists, we just don't have the time to become experts in figuring out how many layers are optimal for a task, or how many filters make sense, or the learning curricula. These are all all hard problems. Um, uh, performance and scaling, I would say that there is some progress in getting deep nets running fast and scaling on big machines. Uh, but but certainly, because deep nets seem to work best in the context of supervised information, uh, not having enough label data is a big challenge. So either you know communities are going to need to come together to conduct labeling campaigns, or we'll need to develop more advanced semi-supervised or active learning techniques to decide what labels we, we, we should uh, ask of the scientists. But there are certainly some, so beyond these, what I would call engineering challenges, uh, there are certainly some longer term challenges to, to think about. Um, so right now, I think there's, there's really very little theory around why deep learning works. Um, uh, so in particular, what are the limits of uh, supervised, semi-supervised, and unsupervised deep learning is, is an open question. GANs, I, I mentioned, is, is really intriguing. Uh, you know, I, I'm shy, I guess, of, of going there, but um, other people in the community are, are more brave than I am. Uh, but essentially, I think, um, when can you have a GAN replace a physical model? Or uh, what are the generalization limits of GANs? That's an open question mark. And I think uh, we, we do need to look at that very carefully before proposing that GANs can, can serve as surrogate models. Interpretability is a, is a big big challenge. So again, domain scientists are really not hap happy to have you know black boxes somewhere in their workflow. So either we develop techniques for introspecting train networks, or we build in interpretability. Uh, that's going to be, a, I think, an important consideration. Uh, uncertainty quantification is important. So certainly, you can have networks predict a class, and then how confident they are about that prediction. Uh, but uh, you know, is the network stable? Is the network stable to perturbations of your input data? Apart from the point estimates for weights and biases, you know, what is the uncertainty estimate uh, for all of the model parameters? These are all questions that that have to be uh, handled. Uh, the the protocol really for when to apply deep learning has to become more more nuanced. Right now, the protocol is you know we're going to throw more data at the problem or a more complex network at the problem, and that's really not comparable to what applied mathematicians do. So, uh, so, anyway, so that, I think, is something which uh, you know, we'll, need to, we'll need to think about. Um, let me speculate, maybe for two minutes, John, I guess, um, uh, three or four slides remaining, uh, uh, on really what's going to happen here. Um, so we think that there will be broad deployments of AI and deep learning tools at HPC centers and clouds. So already happening in the cloud, places like NERSC are already starting to apply, uh, starting to deploy deep learning tools. Uh, I think as different domain science communities understand that this works for supervised formulations of the problem and it's really not having enough label data that's holding them back, then they will get together and they will start running labeling campaigns. Um, there are a lot of low hanging, there's a lot of low hanging fruit right now. Uh, and it is possible that with, uh, with label data, we may just completely solve pattern classification problems and maybe regression problems. But really, the, the more interesting questions are in the longer term. Um, so if you are able to solve segmentation and classification problems completely, uh, then what, what happens next? So I think uh, we then can move on to harder problems, like anomaly detection. Uh, the, the vocabulary of how we do correlation analysis becomes more sophisticated. And maybe uh, you know, we can move on to causal analysis as well. Thirdly, uh, you know, I think I'm hoping that the longer term challenges that, that we called out are formulated and addressed. Um, uh, so that deep learning becomes more viable uh, in in, uh, in in the scientist toolbox, but I think one question to ask is, you know, what what is the value add of the of the scientist of the domain scientist if AI really does take off and and work in practice? So this is, I think, what we anticipate the the workflow to be like. Um, essentially, you're going to have big supercomputers. Um, they'll have access to a lot of data. Uh, you'll have AI systems running on these big supercomputers that can easily solve pattern classification maybe clustering problems, maybe anomaly detection problems. Certainly, we need humans. We need domain scientists to provide labels, because again, labels are an artifact of language. Um, and certainly, I think we do expect humans to do interactive exploration, just to get a sense for whether the data is, is, you know, is, is sane, is it biased, so on and so forth. But fundamentally, I think you know, a lot of the drudgery associated with processing these data sets uh, you know that part gets taken care of by the AI system, so that to me I think frees up 
a domain scientist to think more deeply about underlying mechanisms and hypotheses. And fundamentally, that's what domain scientists want to do anyway. It's not that domain scientists are looking forward to downloading data and running analysis at scale and so on and so forth. This is what they want to do. So in many ways, I think AI will enable them to think deeply, to think harder about, about problems. Uh, so it, in, you know, we, we don't really think of AI as an existential threat for, for science uh, going forward. All right, so last slide. Um, so uh, I think over the talk, I guess essentially I think what I'm trying to communicate is that um, machine learning, deep learning, advanced statistics are important emerging requirements in the DOE community. I think you're going to see that in the NSF, potentially at NCAR as well. Deep learning has definitely enabled breakthroughs in the industry. Uh, there are close analogs to what scientists need in the DOE. Right now, I think a lot of the, the results that we are reporting are, are you know, come from computationally savvy commun communities, uh, high-energy physicists, cosmologists, astronomers. Um, but really, there's a broader class of applications of domain scientists that can benefit. We do think that there'll be a lot of easy problems to tackle in the next few years, a lot of low-hanging fruit. But there are harder challenges that you really have to think about uh, in, in the long term. Finally, I think there's you know, a lot of room to collaborate here. Uh, so we you know, have a certain set of core competencies in the DOE um, at NERSC. Uh, there are a lot of, I think, complementary strengths that a place like NCAR has. So I think there's a lot of room to, uh, to, to work together going forward. All right, so I think that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.